how lucky Rome would be if he could indeed get rid of this urban trash. By Hercules, with Catiline alone flushed away, our country already seems refreshed and restored. Can you think up or invent any evil or crime that he has not conceived of himself? What poisoner anywhere in Italy? What gladiator? What brigand? What cutthroat? What assassin? What forger of wheels? What swindler? What glutton? What spendthrift? What a Adulterer, what loose woman, what corrupter of the young, what corrupt man himself, what degraded individual can be found who does not admit to having lived on the closest terms with Catiline? Hello. <laughs> You're probably going, what? <laughs> okay, I'm going to talk to you today about traitors. Um, traitors to one's country. And this is a speech from Cicero. And let me just say one or two words about him, okay? He's uh, first century BC. He was a man of humble origin. He actually did so well that uh, he made it to, to the Senate. It wasn't easy to get to the Senate, obviously the first in his family, but the Senate was pretty much like, I don't know, shall I say the House of Lords. The Senate was, it was supposed to be elected and that, but it was really the aristocratic class. You didn't just get elected to the Senate, okay? It was aristocrats there. Now, He is perhaps, we would say, one, if not the greatest, one of the very greatest orators in the history of Europe, in the, in the, uh, in the Western world. Okay? There are two kinds of oratory, or perhaps there are many, but one is what is called forensic, meaning the forum, the law courts, judicial oratory. The other is called deliberative, but it's really political, is when you're running for office, the speeches that you uh, give to the people. There are two different types, okay, that uh, you have to use, two different kinds of speeches there. All right, and he's considered the best in both. In English, perhaps, is not as good as it, I think, as you may have sounded in Latin. But in any case, uh, even the writers at the time and later say that uh, um, what the, the, the speech that he's going to give to the public that I'm going to read to you is probably one of the landmarks of Western literature. Now, what happened here? There was this man called Lucius Catilina. Catilina was his surname. We translate it in English as Catiline. Okay. Catiline was an aristocrat. Catiline was in the Senate. He was uh, a pervert. <laughs> Hence all those words that you, that you heard. Anyway, this was the time of depravity. This was the very end of the Roman Republic. Not the Roman Empire, that would come 300 years later or whenever, but the Roman the Republic. And from then you would have, you know, the emperors and dictators and, and so on. Okay, so the very the very last days and uh, depravity of all kinds. Um can be seen and certainly the people in power were leading these kinds this kind of lives and so Catiline and quite a few of his uh, friends and followers were very much in debt and they wanted to remain in the senate and remain with their sort of um, splendid life 
And so they decided that in order to keep their way of life and their status in the Senate, that they would, well, create a color revolution. <laughs> You know, they would, you know, a false flag thing, although it wasn't that, yeah, yeah. You know, marches in Rome, arson, um, chaos everywhere. Then they, they had it all planned out, and then they would come in and tell the people, yes, and then when they got elected again or whatever, they would pass a law, and the first... <laughs> Imagine the gall. The first law that they would pass would be to an amnesty for senators and their debts. <laughs> they wiped clean. Okay. So they are preparing this plot to create chaos in the city, which would perhaps at the time, with everything else that was going on, would have degenerated into a civil war of some type. So these are people, very privileged, who see their power withering away and decide that they would sacrifice the nation in order to keep themselves going. Now, Seneca was the consul, and it was his responsibility to, to deal with all these things, and he managed to uh, suppress the conspiracy and the coup. He actually managed to save his life because they were going to assassinate him the, the evening before he moved, and he notice came to him that he was going to be assassinated. He stopped the whole thing. He uh, eventually, five of them were executed. They did not actually have a trial, but, um, but in those days, he had the approval of the Senate and he had the approval of the people. In fact, when he did that, they proclaimed him the father of the country. But he did one thing which actually raised quite a few eyebrows afterwards and for which he had to continuously explain himself the reasons why. And that is that the leader, Catiline, actually was driven away or escape or he didn't want to arrest him or something but Catiline the leader actually managed to escape so he has to explain to the people why Catiline managed to escape and, and he's going to, because he has to explain his actions, why he did this and not the other, and, and it was the right thing to do. He's trying to convince the people, yeah? Because of that, some um, critics uh, accuse him of being uh, vain and because he talks a lot about why I did this. And, and it, it, it seems if you take it out of context, it seems as if he just wants applause. No, he, well, <laughs> he probably did. But he's trying to explain because he was being criticized. He's trying to explain his reasons. Okay, let me get to it. So this is a speech to the people. It's a political speech. At long last, citizens, Lucius Catalina, Catiline, crazed with recklessness, panting with criminality, treacherously plotting the destruction of his country and menacing you and the city with fire and the sword. This criminal we have expelled from Rome, or released, or followed with our farewells as he was leaving of his own accord. Some of you think one or the other. He has gone, departed, 
cleared off, escaped. No longer will that grotesque monster plan the demolition of our city walls from inside those very walls. And we have indisputably beaten the one man who is at the head of this civil war. No longer then will that dagger of his be twisted between our ribs. In the Campus Martius, in the Forum, in the Senate House, and in our own homes, we will have nothing to fear. When he was driven from the city, he was dislodged from his point of vantage. So now we will be fighting a proper war in the open against an external enemy with nothing to stop us. Without a doubt, we destroyed him and won a magnificent victory when we turned him from secret plots to open banditry. He has not taken with him, as he wished, a dagger covered in blood. He has departed with me still alive. I have wrenched his sword from his hand, and he has left the citizens unharmed and the city still standing. So just think of the sense of grief that must have overwhelmed and crushed him. Now he lies prostrate, citizens, and realizes that he has been struck down and laid low. Again and again, surely, he's turning his eyes back towards this city, bewailing the fact that he has been snatched from his jaws. The city, on the other hand, seems to me delighted that he has finally vomited forth such a pestilence and is it out. But it may be that some of you will take the view that ought really to be the view of everyone and criticize me severely for what my speech boasts of and glories in. The fact that I did not arrest so lethal an enemy but allowed him to escape. However, the blame for that, citizens, lies not with me but with the circumstances. Lucius Catiline ought long ago to have paid the supreme punishment and being executed, as the tradition of our ancestors, the strictness of my office and the national interest demand. And it demands it, demands it of me. But how many people do you think there were who refused to believe my allegations when I was telling you that this was happening. How many who even spoke up for the offenders, who were so stupid as to imagine that the conspiracy did not exist. And how many who were so wicked as to give it their support. Basically, he's saying, don't blame me now. You, I couldn't do it because you didn't allow me. You didn't believe me. If I judge that by removing Lucius Catiline, I could free you completely from danger, I would long ago have risked not only my popularity, but even my life to remove him. But at that time, not even all of you were sufficiently convinced of the existence of the conspiracy. And I saw that if I punished him with the death he deserved, I would make myself so unpopular in my office that I would not be in a position to take action against his accomplices. Instead, therefore, I brought matters to a point where you would be able to fight in the open and also to see clearly who the enemy was. As to how frightened we ought to be of such an enemy now that he is in the open, 
you will be able to divine my own feelings on this, citizens, from the fact that I am disappointed that he has taken so few of his fellow conspirators from the city with him. Indeed, I wish that he had marched out of Rome as the head of his entire force. I find that he took with him Tongiglius, a man he had first had sexual relations with when Tongiglius was a boy, and also Publicius and Minitius, men whose unpaid restaurant bills were hardly likely to destabilize the state. But those he has left behind, who are still there, the traitors inside the Senate, but those he has left behind are quite another matter. What depths they have, what power, oh, what noble birth they have. When I think of our legions in Gaul, and the levy which Quintus Metellus has held, and also of the forces that we are building up day by day, I feel such contempt for that army of his, made up as it is of this army of Catalin, the followers. For that army of his, made up as it is of superannuated no-hopers, losers, prodigal farmers, rural bankrupts, and men who would rather jump bail than desert his ranks. I need not go so far as to present such people with our army's line of battle. All I will have to do is to show them the predator's edict they communicate, and they will fall to the ground. As for those I notice rushing around the forum, standing in front of the Senate House, even coming up, in, uh, coming into the Senate, gleaming with lotions, resplendent in purple, I would rather he had taken this with him as his soldiers. Why are they still here? But they are still here, and we should remember that it is not so much his army that we should be afraid of as those who have deserted it and are still around. In fact, we should all be the more alarmed by their behavior because they are aware that I know what they're up to, but they are not bothered by it. I see who has been allotted, Apulia, who has Etruria, who Pincinum, who the Umbrian coast, and who has demanded responsibility for Rome itself, with the plans for assassination and arson. They are aware that all their plans of the night before last have been reported to me. I revealed them in the Senate yesterday. Catiline himself took fright and fled. These men, on the other hand, what are they waiting for? They are gravely mistaken if they suppose that the leniency I have shown here that hitherto will last forever. I have now achieved my objective to make all of you see that a conspiracy has been openly formed against the state, unless, of course, there is anyone who thinks that people of Catalin's ilk will not share his views. Leniency, then, is no longer appropriate. The situation demands firmness. But even at this late hour, I shall make one concession. They can still leave, still depart, so as to prevent poor Catiline pining away because he misses them so much. I shall even show them the way. He took the Via Aurelia, and if they get a move on, they will catch him up in the evening, by this evening.
How lucky Rome would be if it could indeed get rid of this urban trash. By Hercules, with Catiline alone flushed away, our country already seems refreshed and restored. Or can you think up or invent any evil or crime that he has not conceived of himself? What poisoner anywhere in Italy, what gladiator, what brigand, what cutthroat, what assassin, what forger of wills, what swindler, what glutton, what spendthrift, what adulterer, what loose woman, what corrupter of the young, what corrupt man himself, what degraded individual can be found who does not admit to having lived on closest terms with Catiline. For years now, what murder has been committed without his involvement? What disgusting sexual outrage without his participation? What other man has, has ever presented? What other man has ever presented such great temptation to young men as he? Some of them he had sex with in the most disgraceful way, while with others he scandally submitted himself to their own sexual impulses. Actually, in the Latin, he is even stronger. He says, he talks about penetrating or being penetrated. I mean, <laughs> that, yeah. Anyway, so, to some, he promised whatever it was they hankered after. To others, the death of their parents. And not merely by urging them on, but by giving active help. And how quickly he succeeded in assembling a vast crowd of the worst of society, not only from the city, but from the countryside as well. Not only at Rome, but even in the furthest corners of Italy, there was not a single debtor whom he failed to recruit to his extraordinary criminal alliance so that you can appreciate the diversity of his interests and the full range of his activities, there is no gladiator in a training school who inclines ever so slightly to crime who does not also boast of his close relationship with Catiline. And on the other hand, there is no actor. Actors were seen as very low in the social scale and on the other hand there is no actor at all fickle and useless who does not also claim to be just about his dearest friend. Catiline himself as a result of his repeated sexual misconduct and criminal activities had acquired the ability to endure cold, hunger, thirst and lack of sleep and was therefore hailed as a hero by people of this sort. However, his sexual excess and criminal behavior actually tended to dissipate his physical energy and mental power. If his companions follow where he has gone, if those herds of desperate criminals clear out of the city how happy we will be, how lucky Rome will be, how highly praised my consulship will be. For theirs is no ordinary depravity, their boldness not natural or tolerable. They think of nothing except murder, except arson, except pillage. They have squandered their inheritances, mortgaged their properties, their money ran out long ago, and now their credit has begun to run out as well. But those tastes they had in their days of plenty remain the same. If, in all their drinking and gambling, they were concerned only with reveling and prostitutes, they would indeed be beyond hope. But we could put up with them. But who could possibly put up with cowards plotting against men of courage, fools against the wise, drunks against the sober, sluggards against the wakeful? 
reclining at their banquets, embracing their whores, heavy with wine, stuffed with food, wreathed with flowers, drenched with perfume, and worn out by illicit sex, they belch out their plans for the massacre of decent citizens and the burning of Rome. For my part, I'm certain that these men are going to meet their doom, that the punishment long due for their treachery, wickedness, criminality and self-indulgence is either imminent or, at the very least, on its way. My consulship cannot cure these men, but if it removes them, it will have extended the life of our state, not for some short period, but for many centuries to come. There is no foreign people we need to be afraid of, no king capable of making war on the Roman people, on land and sea, one man's valor, that's Pompeii, once one man's valor has brought universal peace, the internal war is all that remains. Internal war. The plots are within. The danger is within. The enemy is within. Our struggle is against decadence, against madness, against crime. Let me tell you, citizens, I am assuming the leadership of this war. I am taking on the hostility of these criminals myself. Whatever can be cured, I will somehow cure. But whatever has to be cut out, I will not allow to remain as a cancer within our state. So let them either leave or stay in peace, or if they stay, but keep their present intentions, let them expect what they deserve. But there are some who say, citizens, that I have forced Catiline into exile. But if I could produce that effect with just a word, I would do the very same to those who are accusing me of this. Of course, Catiline was so timid or even bashful that he could not endure the consul's voice. And as soon as he was ordered to go into exile, off he went. But yesterday, <coughs> citizens, <coughs> excuse me, But yesterday, citizens, when I had narrowly escaped there, uh, escaped being assassinated in my own home, I summoned the Senate to the temple of Jupiter Stator and put the entire matter before the conscript, the conscript fathers. After Catiline had arrived, what senator, senator spoke to him? A body. Who greeted him? Who even looked on him as merely a bad citizen and not as the deadliest of enemies? In fact, they went further. The leading senators moved away from the area of benches where he had taken his place and left it empty and unoccupied. Then I, the stern consul who forces citizens into exile with a mere word, asked Catiline whether or not he had spent the night in a meeting at the house of Marcus Laca. To begin with, the criminal, aware of his guilt, declined to answer. So I revealed to him further details. I explained what he had done during the night, where he had been, what he had planned for the following night, and how that, that was his assassination, and how he had drawn up his strategy for the entire war. He hesitated. He was trapped. I therefore went on to ask him, what was keeping him from setting out on the journey for which he had long prepared, since I had information that he had sent ahead arms, axes, rods of office, trumpets, military standards, and also that silver eagle to which he had even dedicated a shrine at his house. 
So how could I be said to be forcing into exile a man who I saw had already entered upon war? Manlius the centurion, who has set up a military camp in the territory of Fesule, was, I suppose, acting on his own authority when he declared war on the Roman people, and that camp is not in fact waiting at this very moment for Catiline to join it as, it, as its leader. And Catiline himself, forced into exile, has actually taken himself off to Massilia as his claim and not to his camp. What a wretched business it is, not simply running the country, but even saving it. For suppose that Catiline, trapped and thwarted by the measures I have taken, the labours I have undergone, and the risks I have run, now suddenly takes fright, changes his mind, abandons his supporters, gives up his plans for war, and turns from the path of crime and war to flight and exile. In that case, people will say not that I have torn from him the arms of criminality, or that my precautions have paralyzed him with terror, or that he has been forced to give up his hopes and his attempt, but that an innocent man has been driven into exile without trial by the violent threats of the consul. And if he does follow that path, there will be people who will regard him not as criminal but as pitiable and will regard me not as an exceptionally diligent consul but as the cruelest of tyrants. But it will still be worth my while, citizens, to brave the storm of this false and unjust calumny just so long as you are spared the danger of this horrifying, unspeakable war. So, by all means, let it be said that I have forced him into exile just so long as that is where he goes. But trust me, he will not go there. Never, citizens, for the sake of being spared hostility, will I pray to the immortal gods for you to receive news that Lucius Catiline is at the head of an enemy army and is mobilizing his troops. But I am afraid this is indeed the news you will be hearing within three days, and I am much more concerned about possible future criticism for having let him go than for having driven him out. As for those who claim that he was driven out when in fact he left by his own choice, just think what they would be saying if I had executed him. Yet those who keep saying that Catiline is on his way to Massilia are not so much aggrieved that he is doing this as afraid in case he is. None of them is so kind-hearted that they really wish him to go to Massilia rather than to Manlius. And as for Catiline himself, even if, by Hercules, he had never previously contemplated that he is n what he is now doing, he would still prefer to be killed in uh, brigandage than live in exile. As it is, everything has gone for him exactly as he wished and planned, except that he did not manage to assassinate me before he left Rome. We ought, therefore, to hope that he is going into exile rather than complain that he is. But why have I been talking for so long about a single enemy, an enemy who now admits that he is an enemy, and one whom I have no fear of, because, as I have always hoped, the city wall now lies between us? And why am I saying nothing about those who conceal the fact that they are enemies, who have not left Rome, and who are here in our midst? 
I should prefer not to have to punish these men if I can help it, but instead cure them and reconcile them with their country, something which should not be impossible so long as they are prepared to listen to what I have to say. Let me set out for you, citizens, the types of men from which these forces are drawn. I will then give each group, if I can, the medicine of my advice and persuasion. <coughs> first money. The first group consists of people who have large debts and more than enough property to pay them off, but who are so attached to that property that nothing can set them free. They have every appearance of respectability because they are in fact rich, but their intentions and principles are utterly scandalous. Do you really think you can be wealthy and well provided with land, properties, silver, slaves and everything else and yet hold back from selling some of your possessions to improve your credit? What then are you waiting for? War? Really? And do you seriously imagine that amidst the general devastation your own property will, be, will remain sacrosanct? New books then? Those who expect that from Catiline are mistaken. By my generosity, new books will indeed be provided. Auctioneers, auctioneers, catalogues. That, I tell you, is the only thing that is going to save those who do have property. Indeed, if they had been prepared to do this earlier, instead of stu stupidly trying to pay the interest on their debts with the income of their states, they would today be both richer and better citizens. But this is actually the group we need be frightened frightened of least, because either they can be persuaded to change their views, or if they do not, they will be more likely, I think, simply to say prayers against their country than to take arms against it. <laughs> They're more likely to say prayers against their country than to take arm, arms against it. So weak people, really. Okay, the second group of these traitors in the Senate who haven't left, the second group consists of those who, despite being overwhelmed with debt, look forward to ruling, are hungry for power, and think that with the country in turmoil they will be able to obtain offices they have no hope of obtaining when the country is at peace. To these people, I think I should give this advice. The same advice, in fact, as I give to all others, that they should abandon all hope of attaining their goal. First of all, they need to be aware that I am keeping watch over the country, I am on hand to defend it, and I am looking out for it. Secondly, the loyal citizens are showing great courage, the populace, vast as it is, is showing complete unity, and on top of this our military forces are strong. Finally, the immortal gods will bring help in person to this unconquered people, this glorious empire, and these fairest of cities against the terrible criminal violence that we face. But imagine that these men achieve what they so furiously desire. Surely, amid the ashes of the city and the blood of the citizens, which in their wicked and criminal hearts they long for, they will not aspire to become then consuls, dictators, even kings. Surely they must see that if they succeed in obtaining the offices they covet, they will only end up having to hand them over to some runaway slave or gladiator. The third group consists of men who are quite old now, 
but who have kept fit and are still strong. Mang Lius, the man Catiline is taking over from, is a member of this group. They are the men from the colonies Sulla founded. Now I recognize that in the main, these colonies consist of loyal, courageous men, but all the same, there are some colonists who, on suddenly being given money they never expected to have, have been throwing it around in a prodigal and high-handed manner. This is about the corruption in the provinces. Mm. Building as if they were aristocrats, delighting in coaches, litters, armies of servants, armies of servants, and sumptuous banquets. They have fallen so deeply into debt that if they are ever to become solvent again, Sulla would have to be brought back from the dead. They have also driven quite a few poor and needy farmers into hoping, as they do, that the plundering of former times is going to be repeated. Both these classes of people I treat as belonging to the same group, plunderers and thieves, but I advise them to give up their insane thoughts of prescriptions and dictatorships. The horror of that time is branded so deeply on our national psyche that today not only men but even, I think, dumb animals would refuse to countenance its return. The fourth group is certainly varied mixed and unruly. These are people who went, at, who went under long ago, who have never got their heads above water, said the loser, who partly through laziness, partly through business failures, and partly also through ex extravagance, stagger on with long-standing debts, and who have given up in the face of bankruptcy, summonses, hearings and sequestrations, a very large group of people who are reported to have abandoned Rome and the country districts for that military camp. These people I would class not so much as king soldiers as lazy bike backsliders. If they cannot stand on their own two feet, it would be much better if they fell as soon as possible, just so long as they do not disturb the state or even their immediate neighbors. For I cannot see why, if they are incapable of living honorable lives, they should want to die in dishonorable circumstances, or why they imagine death will be less distressing to them if they meet their end along with many others than if they do so on their own. The fifth group consists of murderers, cutthroats, and every other type of criminal. I do not want these men to abandon Catiline, and in fact they cannot be made to do so. Let them be killed as brigands, since they are far more of them than the prison can cope with. The final group is last uh, not just in number but also in character and way of life. This is Catalan's very own, his elect, his special band of lovies. They are the ones who see, they are the ones you see with carefully arranged hair moisturized faces, either too young to shave or else with full beards, with tunics down to their wrists and ankles, and wearing dresses, not togas. All the energy of their lives and the labor of their waking hours is devoted to dinners that last till dawn. In this clique, every gambler, every adulterer, and every filthy pervert is to be found. These boys, so elegant and refined, have perfected the art not just of sex, active or passive. 
not just of singing and dancing, but of wielding the dagger and poisoning food. Unless they leave Rome, unless they die, even if Catiline himself should die, I tell you that there will be a spawning ground of future Catilines in our country. But what is it those pathetic creatures want? Surely they are not going to arrive at the camp with their fancy women in tow. Yet how will they manage without them, especially the, during these long winter nights? How will they endure the frost and snow up there in the Apennines? Perhaps they expect to endure the glacial temperatures more easily because they have had plenty of practice dancing naked at dinner parties. What a truly terrifying war this is going to be with Catalan in command of this Praetorian cohort of poofs. Now, citizens, prepare your own armies and your own defenses to fight these cracked troops of Catalans first. Pit your consuls and generals against this exhausted and wounded gladiator. Then lead out the flower and pride of all Italy to fight this banished and enfeebled collection of castaways. The towns and colonies of Italy are more than a match for the hills and forests of Catiline. Nor is there any need for me to compare the other resources, equipment and defensive forces that you possess with what brigands total lack of such advantages. But if we leave on one side all the things that we are supplied with and he lacks, the Senate, the Roman uh, equestrians, the Roman people, the city, the treasury, the revenues, all of Italy, all the provinces, foreign countries, if, leaving all these on one side, we choose to make a comparison of the actual principles that are in conflict, we will be able to tell from that alone how inferior their position is. On our side fights decency, on theirs depravity. On our side fights modesty, on theirs perversion. On ours, honesty, on theirs, deceit. On ours, duty, on theirs, crime. On ours, steadfastness, on theirs, hysteria. On ours, honor, on theirs, disgrace. On ours, self-restraint, on theirs, self-indulgence. On ours, justice, self-control, courage, prudence, and all the virtues, fighting against injustice, extravagance, sloth, recklessness, and all the vices. Finally, wealth is fighting against poverty, good principles against bad, reason against madness, and well-grounded confidence against absolute despair. In a conflict and battle of this kind, even if human strength were to fail, would the immortal gods themselves not step in to ensure that these outstanding virtues triumph over those many extreme vices? Under these circumstances, I urge you, citizens, as I did before, to defend your homes and guard them vigilantly. For my part, I have taken all the necessary steps to ensure that the city is properly protected without disturbing you and without declaring a state of emergency. I have informed all your fellow citizens in the towns and colonies of Catalan's departure last night, and they will easily be able to defend their towns and territories. The gladiators, a force Catalan's Catiline thought he could rely on, absolutely, although they are more loyal to the country than some of our patricians are, will be kept under guard on my authority. Quintus Metellus, whom I sent in advance to the Umbrian coast and Pitinum for precisely this person, 
this purpose will either crush Catiline or put a stop to all his movements and plans and to all the other matters to be decided, put into action and carried out, I shall now consult the Senate, which, as you see, is being convened right now. But now to those who have stayed behind in Rome, or rather to those whom Catiline has deliberately planted in Rome to destroy the city and each one of you, I will keep repeating the following warning, after all, they may be enemies today, but they were born as Roman citizens. If anyone has felt that I have been too lenient up until now, it was because I have been waiting for what was still hidden to burst out into the open. But for the future, I can no longer forget that this is my country, that I am your consul, that it is my duty either to live with you or give my life for you. The gates are unguarded and there is no ambush on the road. So if anyone wishes to leave, I am prepared to turn a blind, blind eye. But if anyone makes a move inside the city, if I discover any plan or scheme, let alone any act against our country, that person should be aware that Rome has all-seeing consuls, it has outstanding magistrates, it has a strong senate, it has weapons, and it has a prison, which our ancestors ordained as a punishment for serious and flagrant crimes. And in all these measures, citizens, I shall make sure that this serious crisis is put down with the least possible disturbance, this extreme danger put down without a state of emergency being declared, and this biggest and most brutal civil war in history put down in a, with a single civilian, myself, as your leader and commander. In managing this situation, I shall make sure, citizens, so far as is possible, that not a single traitor inside the city shall pay the penalty for his crimes. But if the extent of manifest crime, if the scale of the danger hanging over our country compels me to devi deviate from this policy of leniency, then I shall certainly make sure, and this is something one hardly dare hope for in such a major hazardous war, that no good citizen loses his life, and that all your lives are saved by the punishment of only a few individuals. When I make you this promise, citizens, I do it not on the basis of my own intelligence or of any human wisdom, but as a result of many and ambiguous signs from the immortal gods under whose guidance I have arrived at these hopes and this policy. They do not guard us from afar, as in days gone by, against a distant foreign enemy, but here present among us now, they are defending their temples and the houses of the city with the protection of their divine power. Your duty, citizens, is to pray to them, to worship them, and to implore them. Now that all the forces of our external enemies have been defeated on land and sea, to defend this city, which they have ordained, should be the most beautiful, the most prosperous, and the most powerful city in the world from the unspeakable criminality of citizen traitors. Well, you know, we don't have anyone like that anymore. <laughs> We don't have Churchill anymore. Why not? Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.